Hello everyone, Salam alaikum. Today we will start vascular session and we will start with uh, Dr. Lamia. Okay, here you are, Dr. Lamia. Yes, a 55 years old man presents with pulse rotation at uh, 200 meters and normal peripheral pulse uh, Venous uh, duplex scan, ABPI, CT embryo. CT venography, uh, arterial duplex uh, scan. Uh, we start investigation by uh, venous duplex scan. Okay, this patient with a claudication, this is arterial claudication. Yeah, yeah. Arterial duplex scan. Why venous duplex? Arterial, arterial duplex scan. And why not ABBI? Arterial. Ankle brachial pressure index. If you will watch the vascular lecture, will in most instances, normal instances like this, we will start initially by ankle brachial pressure index. Do you have any other opinion, Dr. Montasir? Uh, no. Okay. So it is, it is ABBI, okay? okay? We will talk about investigation, but this patient, there is a history of arterial claudication, but normal and palpable pulses, and this will require ABBI resting and might be post-exercise ABBI. Okay? Yeah. It is not uncommon for a high-grade iliac stenosis to give rise to a normal bubble, bulb bubble pulses and resting ankle pressures normal as well. During this exercise, there is often a drop in the ABBI signifying that the patient has a stenosis not easily assessed during rest, okay? So ABBI might be during rest or, or during exercise but whatever it is ABBI. So the BMJ best practice, the first investigation to order for peripheral vascular disease for acute limb ischemia is ABBI, okay? This is the first investigation to order from BMJ. And the sensitivity of 95% uh, and the specificity of 100%, okay? But if we have patients with non-compressible arteries, like long-standing diabetes, renal patients on dialysis, so might not be accurate. Okay. Investigations to consider. There are many investigations. One of them is a duplex ultrasound. So in MRCS, the second investigation is duplex ultrasound. Okay, the peak systolic velocity ratio more than two on the duplex ultrasound indicates stenosis of more than 50% of the arterial, arterial diameter. Okay, so it is used to assess location, degree of stenosis, and the patency of bypass graft. And the sensitivity and specificity of more than 50% stenosis from the iliac artery to popliteal artery are 90 to 95%. But this is a second one after ankle brachial pressure index. Okay. I will talk about another investigation. One of them is CT angio versus MRC, magnetic resonance angio. CT angio, this is a gold standard for diagnosis. The gold standard a diagnostic tool of a choice, but we require IV. Is it wrong in, uh, in patient with kidney disease or acute kidney injury? Yes, but they can do, okay? But MRA, they cannot do why? Because the gadolinium has caused nephrogenic systemic fibrosis in patient with chronic renal insufficiency. So CT angio, can be done in patient with acute skin injury until a limit, okay? 
but still can be done and it is the gold standard. How to treat the acute limb ischemia? This is a question asked and we need to clarify it very clear, okay? I will mute the mics, okay? And I will talk about this in a bit. So acute limb ischemia, th there are many etiology for this acute limb ischemia. Might be acute on top of chronic. This means that there is elderly patient, for example, with a atherosclerosis. This is a chronic long-standing arterial angiopathy, okay? By time, this is stenosed segment because of the atheromatous plaque will be a stasis and this stasis will make a thrombus. This thrombus on a top of atheromatous plaque will cause acute incident on top of chronic atherosclerotic disease. This is a type of acute on top of chronic, okay? Acute embolic manifestation, we have to have some source of embolism from where this embolus detached and then dislodged in a lower limb artery or upper limb artery from AF, mural thrombus of the heart, or any other cause of like, for example, triple A with a mural thrombus means that there is abdominal aortic aneurysm with a mural thrombus that's been detached might be. So in the embolism, there is acute incident and embolic source. In acute, on top of chronic, there is a chronic, chronic elderly patient with smoking, atherosclerosis, and then on top of that, this patient already there is angiopathy, but the arterial tree in a patient with embolic manifestation, it is healthy, okay? So this is our two main examples for acute limb ischemia. The first line in treatment of acute limb ischemia is urgent assessment for revascularization or amputation. And you might have antiplatelet therapy, aspirin versus clopidogrel, analgesia, anticoagulation, unfractionated heparin of a choice, and risk modification, risk factor modification, giving statins, bisoprolol, adjusting the blood pressure, okay, adjusting diabetes, everything in risk factor modification, and endovascular revascularization and the intraarterial thrombolysis. How to choose this and this? This is what, what is important for me. So I clarified this two in two pages. So let's talk about urgent assessment for revascularization or amputation. Urgent assessment for revascularization or amputation it is not a surgical emergency. Acute limb ischemia is, an, is a medical emergency. Patients who have sudden decrease in limb perfusion with a threatened tissue viability require urgent history examination and then rapid assessment by vascular surgeon, ABBI, your duplex, then if required, CT angio, and then you will see this degree of peripheral arterial disease, and if there is non-viable limb, tissue loss, nerve damage, sensory loss, this essentially will require amputation without thinking. For us as MRCS level, don't think about, oh, it is, so it is non-viable, so it is amputation. Viable limb, these patients will have no significant tissue loss, no sensory loss, no nerve damage, and this arterial anatomy will be defined and undergo re revascularization, either by angioplasty or surgical bypass. I will return back to the same slide 
and we will talk about endovascular revascularization and intraarterial thrombolysis. Endovascular revascularization and intraarterial uh, thrombolysis. Urokinase is a primary choice, and I know in some uh, Q banks, Alteplase is the first, but here in the best practice, urokinase or catheter directed uh, thrombolysis using urokinase. So if you have a viable limb and you have continuous symptoms, revascularization is, is recommended. Okay, and we will start always by endovascular revascularization, which is a preferred option to bypass surgery, of course. Especially if you have patient with severe comorbidities, so you will do revascularization. We have percutaneous transluminal angioplasty with a balloon dilatation, stents, or percutaneous mechanical thrombus extraction, or thromboaspiration. Okay, so we have percutaneous angioplasty. Localized intraarterial perfusion of thrombolytics is used with or without concomitant, concomitant use of mechanical thrombectomy. Okay, so you can do this revascularization using percutaneous transluminal angioplasty, and we will see it later examples, and you can use adjunct intraarterial infusion of thrombolytics. And urokinase is the most widely used thrombolytic agent. Okay. I will return back to the same slide and I will talk about surgical revascularization because it will come in your exam and will give numbers. And these numbers are addressed in the B BMJ here. So for patients with a viable limb who continue to have symptoms, revascularization is recommended. Options include surgical thrombectomy and bypass. If we have a to iliac disease, if it's stenosis more than 10 cm or a chronic occlusion more than 5 cm or heavily calcific lesions or lesions associated with aortic aneurysm, so surgical revascularization is recommended. This is aortoiliac disease indications. For common femoral artery, if the lesion is more than 10 cm or heavily calcified lesions more than 5 cm or lesions involving the opening or the ostium of superficial femoral artery and lesions in the popliteal artery, still surgical revascularization is recommended. Common femoral endarterectomy is performed for common femoral artery lesions, and this surgery has a high patency rate, but might be associated with significant complications. Why this complicated stuff? because some questions will be difficult to answer. So I need you to pick these questions from this BMJ because it addressed everything clearly. Okay, so unlike FEMPOP lesions or aortoiliac lesions, failed into endovascular intervention can be can preclude surgical revascularization. So careful selection is essential and surgical revascularization patency rate for infra be below the popliteal artery is poor. So when you have infra popliteal artery problem and there is a tissue loss, don't think like vascular surgeon. In this situation, do amputation, okay? Why? Because if you will go deeper inside as a vascular surgeon, you will might be misled because they even need an MDT for a choice of 
some uh, decision for some problems, okay? Later on in September 2020 exam, we'll talk about, about three or, uh, vascular surgery scenarios, and we will remember this from here. Okay, amputation, again, if part of a limb is clearly non-viable, okay, from the beginning or after attempts of revascularization, failure, amputation is required. If we have chronic severe limb ischemia, this means that severe means critical limb ischemia. And the critical limb ischemia means that there is wrist pain, ischemic wrist pain, ABBI less than 0.4, tissue loss in the form of ulcer or gangrene. This is a triad of critical limb ischemia. Okay, so if we have a critical limb ischemia, the same assessment for revascularization as the same before, and antiplatelet therapy risk factor modification and the endovascular revascularization. And there are options like spinal cord stimulation, autologous bone marrow stem cell transplantation and amputation, this is not needed. Just amputation, if patient with a critical limb ischemia who are unsuitable for revascularization, or those will not be unable to walk even before the episode of the critical limb ischemia, or those who have a limited life expectancy. So amputation is required, okay? Regarding endovascular revascularization for critical limb ischemia, we will have the following. Angioplasty, stents, atherectomy, but mainly angioplasty. There are many types and uh, like drug eluting stents, cutting balloons and this stuff. But endovascular revascularization is recommended for aortoiliac disease with stenosis less than 10 centimeter and chronic occlusion that are less than five centimeter. So this is called like short segment stenosis. In the orthoiliac disease, less than 10 centimeter, and in the chronic occlusion, should be less than five centimeter. For femoropopliteal artery stenosis, is recommended if there is less than 10 centimeter stenosis or calcific stenosis less than five centimeter. Again, the same. Please note that for infrapopliteal artery lesions, endovascular treatment has been limited to threatened limb loss only. So again, if we have infrapopliteal artery lesion, endovascular treatment is limited to threatened limb loss only. Unlike fempop lesions or aortoiliac lesions, failed endovascular intervention for this infrapopliteal artery lesions can preclude surgical revascularization. So careful selection is essential. I know it is many informations, but you have to think about a question and you remember some information from BMG, which addressed which short segment is so if short segment, if this is a long segment, he will tell you it is a long segment stenosis. So endovascular uh, or angioplasty or PTA will not be uh, recommended or will not be uh, indicated. So you will step up for a surgical bypass. 
Okay, so uh, next question, Dr. Montasser. A uh, 56-year-old <clears throat> man presents with bilateral potok claudication at 100 meters and impotence. He is a heavy smoker. His symptoms have got growth over the past six months. On examination, he is found to have weak bilateral femoral pulses, but a full complement of pulses down both legs. Is it bilateral external iliac stenosis or critical limb ischemia or Lerch syndrome or intermittent claudication or spinal claudication? So what do you think you have got bilaterally, you have impotence and you have reduced or thin bilateral femoral pulses? Mm, okay. Spinal claudication? Well, it's spinal claudication will affect the impotence the, the arterial system uh, it is no nerves so no it's affect uh, 100 meters and there is impotence so what do you think uh, bilateral external iliac stenosis no i open the mic for you sam so uh, answer for this will be uh, larry syndrome because uh, Leric syndrome classically comes with uh, buttock claudification and erectile dysfunction because of uh, internal iliac uh, occlusive disease. It so is because it is a war to iliac. Auto iliac, yes. Again, Leric or Leric or Leric syndrome is a war to iliac occlusive disease. This means a war to and the common iliacs. So the disease will be here in this segment, or to iliac. In another example of the eye files, you will find bilateral iliac disease. Yes, it is. but not external. It is common iliacs. So because it is a word to iliac, so it can be saying like a word, a com a bilateral common iliacs. So this will lead to, it is bilateral now because it is at the beginning of the artery that will uh, bifurcates into two that so you will have bilateral reduced or absent femoral pulses but claudication okay mainly buttocks okay and erectile dysfunction because the arterial system for the uh, penis will not be going well so this will lead to erectile dysfunction so please don't forget, again, buttocludication, importance in men, absent or reduced femoral pulses. This is a war to iliac disease in brackets, Lerich or Lerich or Lerich syndrome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Montasser. No problem. Thank you, Dr. Sam. It is about to solve more. It is if your exam next January, you must solve more. You are okay. Sam is okay. Montaster is okay. Shahid is okay. But we need to be active and solving more. Dr. Ishwar and Dr. Sam. Thank you, Dr. Montaster. So, Dr. Ishwar and then Dr. Sam. Yeah, hello. Hello. Uh, 20 year old woman presents with extensive recurrent left leg varicose veins. She has a strong family history of varicose veins. Six years ago, she underwent injection therapy to her varicose veins. Now she presents with intermittent swelling of her left leg and marked hemocytic deposits around her gator area. 
So in this division, we will be famous like scan, ABPI, CT angiogram, CT venography, arterial doctor scan. So I think it's a super familiar day, chronic very cold strain. So first in this division, it will be a, a venous suspect scan. So this is simply varicose veins. So venous duplex scan is the initial uh, investigation for this varicose veins. Okay, so any varicose vein investigation should start with venous duplex. It can comment on the degree of the venous reflux, anatomy of the veins, and it is also operator dependent but the excellent line, first line uh, investigation. The treatment of uh, venous, uh, of uh, varicose veins we will come later onto the same slides, but before this, we will continue to have uh, Sam. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ishwar. And then after Dr. Sam, we will open for Arish and then Kazi. Okay, here you are, Dr. Sam. So 68-year-old man attends his GP with five-week history of pain in his right calf uh, associated with numbness in his foot during exercise. Typically, pain comes on walking 50 meters, but sooner when he uh, but sooner when he's walking uphill. On examination, he has good bilateral femoral pulses, but no pulses distal uh, to his uh, femorals bilaterally. Uh, he smokes 40 cigarettes a day, no past uh, medical history. Uh, options, bilateral external iliac stenosis, uh, critical uh, limb ischemia, Lyric syndrome, uh, intermittent claudication, uh, and uh, spinal claudication. Sorry. Just one minute. Yes. So uh, new onset history uh, with numbness uh, and smoker. So, uh, this will be intermittent claudication because of history of smoking and uh, pain on uh, walking and uh, walking uphill. Spinal claudication is the uh, intermittent claudication. Intermittent claudication. So if there is, uh, sorry, if there is a pain in right calf with numbness in his foot during exercise, it will be spinal claudication because uh, intermittent claudication will not give a neuro neuropathic symptom. It can be because the arterial system will supply the nerves. So it can be, yes. Okay. Then I will, uh, I don't know, I'll stick with intermittent claudication. Okay. Oh. So worse when working uphill, this is intermittent claudication. Again, worse when walking uphill. This is intermittent claudication. But if it improves when walking uphill, this is spinal. So the numbness of the foot related to short history and improve with the improvement of the collaterals while the patient's stopping. He is a smoker and clinically he got superficial femoral artery, occlusion or stenosis. The right leg is worse than the left, which at present is asymptomatic only because the patient does not walk for, uh, far enough uh, to subject himself for claudication. So it is intermittent one. I will talk also later about spinal canal stenosis. But before this, we will ask ourselves, what is the treatment options for intermittent claudication. From BMJ, the question is, is it lifestyle limiting or no? If it's fine and it is not 
uh, lifestyle limiting. So we will go with conservative antiplatelet exercise and risk factor modification. So again, if we have intermittent occlidication, not lifestyle limiting, we will do this. No, it is life limiting. So we will think about the same uh, exercise, symptom relief, continue, uh, antiplatelet, continuous risk factor modification, and we will consider uh, revascularization options. And by the way, it will be the same revascularization options we will talk about. Again, I am stressing on this for, uh, for infrapopliteal artery lesions, endovascular treatment is limited only to threatened limb loss. It is not the femoropopliteal and the orthoiliac lesions because if you fail the endo endovascular intervention, this will prevent you from surgical revascularization. This means that if you have infra popliteal artery lesions, you will try endovascular treatment. And carefully select your patient because endovascular treatment is limited if you have a threatened limb loss. And if you fail this endovascular treatment, you will be prevented from going further for reva surgical revascularization. Okay, and it is the same as we told you uh, for our to iliac disease and uh, our to iliac disease if it's not more than 10% or uh, femoral, ar femoral artery disease more than 10%. This is called, uh, this is for endovascular. If less, then we will do endovascular. If more, this is, means long segment, so you will do surgical. Again, endovascular revascularization. If you have short aortoiliac disease, means that short segment stenosis less than 10 centimeter. For fem pop artery stenosis from the femoral to popliteal artery stenosis, endovascular. If you have short segment stenosis less than 10, 10 centimeter, or calcified less than five centimeter, but you will convert to think about surgical options, surgical revascularization, if you have more than these centimeters. If you have more than 10 centimeters, this is called long segment stenosis, and if it's more than 10 centimeter. It, it will not be amenable to angioplasty, so you will do it surgical. I hope this option is clear. For spinal canal stenosis, you will have a patient with a back pain complaining of more distributing pain. It is not localized to area like uh, common, uh, uh, common femoral artery area or angiosome, a specific angiosome. No, it is, it is not like this. It is a claudication, so it will follow nerves. So it might go for the hip, claudication, thigh, buttocks, or leg pain. It is dermatomal, not angiosomal, and associated might be associated with weakness, motor weakness. And occur on standing and relieved by position change, such as driving a bicycle, sitting, or stop, stooping forwards. This is, you will relieve by this bicycling, you will relieve uh, the stenosis by doing the flexion, okay? This now is a spinal canal stenosis, but before it was arterial. Again, the arterial can have some sort of sensory or nerve affections because the arterial system will supply the nerves. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, Dr. Arij. Yes. Yes, go on. Okay, 49 years old, diabetic man. 
is referred to the vascular surgeon with a seven month history of worsening claudication in post leg. On examination, he has a good bilateral femoral pulse and popliteal pulse, but no distal pulses. His right foot has punched out ulcer over the first metatarsopharyngeal joint on the plantar aspect. He also has a necrotic fifth stool. He deny any pain. Uh, bilateral external stenosis, critical limb ischemia, Larry syndrome, intermittent claudication, spinal claudication. Okay. Uh, seven months worsening claudication. And there is no distal pulse. Mm, there is arterial ulcer. Uh, necrotic, I think it's a critical limb ischemia. What is the meaning of uh, critical limb ischemia? Ischemic risk pain, ABBI less than 0.4, and tissue loss in the form of ulcer or gangrene. So this patient, like you said, thank you, Arij, this is a critical limb ischemia. You have wrist pain, the patient is sitting while he is complaining of claudication. If you will measure the ABBI, essentially it might be below 0.4 to or 0.3. And it, this is likely due to severe neuropathy, this wrist pain. But if the patient, sorry, if the patient denies any pain, this might be because of the affection of the nerves, because of the affection of the arteries that supply these nerves. Tissue loss is an evidence of vascular disease. And it is a serious situation, require urgent attention, and most neuropathic ulcers in diabetes have a ischemic component to them. Again, don't think that all arterial ulcers should be painful and all, uh, most of diabetic ulcers are uh, non-painful and most of the ischemic ulcers will be painful. Okay, so if you have critical limb ischemia, how you will deal with the critical limb ischemia? You will the same, you will, first line is assessment for revascularization because this is critical. Okay, so uh, spinal condication, yes, of course, yes, a spinal condication is a brain, yes, Dr. Taha, yani, arterial condication is a symptom of artery stenosis. Spinal condication is a symptom of pain due to compression on nerves of the spinal cord due to stenosis. Why ulcer in the plantar region? We will come back to see why ulcer in the plantar region. Okay, again, regarding the position, just wait. The first metarsal joint on the plantar aspect. It is, it is the arterial ulcer it is like this you know plantar flexion it is a plantar surface it is the aspect below it is most of the time uh, below uh, the metatarsal head in the uh, plantar surface it is like this it is like this so someone right on the chat okay i will allow some people to open the mic Okay. Or if you have any question because like this, you can ask at the end. We have a comparison. We have posted a table comparing the location of each ulcer, venous gaiter area, and if by long time converted to heaped up and raised the edges, it will be squamous cell carcinoma, margoline, RT, and venous most commonly painless and associated with varigosities or deep venous insufficiency. Arterial is bunched out. Okay, bunched out means like it is bitten. It is all bunched out, okay? 
and it is over the first metatarsus. This is a common location for this arterial ulcer. And because of ischemia, in most situations, it can be painful. Neuropathic diabetic ulcer, it is non-painful because the microangiopathy happening in the diabetes will lead to affection of the nerve supply of the arterial supply to the nerves leads to less or no sensation. Okay. So again, assessment for revascularization, we will have uh, antiplatelet therapy and continuous risk modification and endovascular revascularization, the same. If you remember, the same. Endovascular, endovascular, and then surgical. And then please note that infrapopletal artery lesions, endovascular treatment has been limited to threatened limb loss only. And it is unlike these, the aortoiliac, and unlike the fempop stenosis, the infrapopletal, if you fail this endovascular treatment, you will not be able to do the surgical. So careful selection is essential. And again, amputation patient with a critical limb ischemia who are unsuitable for revascularization or those unable to walk before the episode of the critical ischemia, so they already have a problem. So your revascularization is gonna fail. If the patient is bedridden already and he was unable to walk before this episode of critical limb ischemia or limited life expectancy. You are not expecting that this patient will live more than five or 10 years. So this means that your operation of low uh, lifestyle change because the patient already got limited life expectancy. So amputation is an option. Okay. Uh, Dr. Arij, Dr. Kazi, yes, Dr. Kazi, and then Dr. Aman. Hi. Uh, so a 72 years old man attends his GP with cramping pain in his buttocks that occurs on walking. When he develops the cramp, he has to rest until they disappear. On examination, it is difficult to feel his distal lower limb pulses. On dorsal left foot is a deep, sharply defined ulcer that uh, the patient finds painful. So first of all, it's a painful ulcer. And he has uh, no pulses actually in the lower limbs. So his arteries have been involved. So I will go with arterial ulcer. Again, tell us again. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, of course. So it's a painful ulcer plus with no distal lower limb pulses and the location of the ulcer, I would go with arterial ulcer. Very nice. And again, again the same. Venous ulcer, gaiter area, okay. Arterial ulcer can be punched out and it can be also unhealing because there is no arterial system and it can be on the pressure points okay because yes. someone asked the plantar surface is essential in neuropathic no it is on the pressure points you know like the bed sore uh, when a patient is bedridden or the pressure ulcer you mean the cupitus ulcer this is the etiology is before because of the compression by the patient while he is bedridden and sleeping Compression, and there is already patient is a frail elderly with low circulation, multiple comorbidities, arterial diseases. So the skin over the back will complain of necrosis, and then you will have an ulcer. So arterial ulcer can be in any area on the pressure areas and lateral malleoli and tibial areas. But again, neuropathic ulcer, you know, 
it is associated with diabetes, it is painless, and with no component, uh, like, you know, there is no component called uh, arterial in the neuropathic. In most situation, in most situation, you will find it as uh, painless, not painful, and most of the arterial system is okay. And neuropathic and diabetic ulcers, arteri uh, sorry, arterial and the neuropathic ulcers are, are not away from each other because arterial ulcer later on will contain a neuropathic component as we addressed before. So, excellent. So we have here intermittent claudication. We have also uh, uh, this is because of the crampings and because of this. So there is ischemia and this ischemia cold feet, hair loss, toenail dystrophy, cyanosis, ischemic ulcerations. So it is sharply defined, punched out on the pressure areas. Contrast angio can help defining the arterial lesion. Okay, uh, thank you so much. So, uh, Dr. Kazi and Dr. Aman, who is uh, who's turn? Hello. Yes. Uh, a 62 year old woman presents to her general practitioner with a raised pink papule on her left arm. On examination, you note that the lesion is painless and firm and arises from an underlying scar. Uh, she mentions that the scar was from a burn injury that happened 20 years ago. Uh, options are venous ulcer, margulin ulcer, Cushing's ulcer, diabetic and arterial ulcer. Uh, as she is giving a history of burn, so I think uh, it can be margulin ulcer. Okay, what is curling ulcer? Uh, curling ulcer will uh, occur in the GIT after uh, inhalational injury in the burns. Curling ulcers are mucosal burns, basically, in the GI, upper GI tract, secondary to burns. Not burn, because in the burn will be massive fluid loss. So the arterial circulation to the GIT, the duodenum, and then the stomach, this will lead to reduced circulation to the duodenum. And the stomach lead to what? To ulceration, because ulceration. of blood supply. This is curling. What's Cushing, Cushing ulcer? Cushing ulcer uh, because of, uh, I think, head injury, uh, because of uh, Cushing reflex, uh, there will be uh, hypertension uh, and bradycardia, which will cause a, a Cushing ulcer in the stomach. Yes, it is a gastric ulcer because of associated pressure raised. Very nice. Okay. So this is squamous cell carcinoma margulin ulcer because of chronicity, burn or venous, uh, burn or venous. Okay, so varicose veins treatment. We said that the UK, current UK uh, guidelines regarding varicose veins, we have, we said that uh, endothermal ablation and then after Then after, uh, if in, uh, endothermal ablation will be failing, there is uh, foam sclerotherapy. But when we search the BMG, we find the following. We find they divided this for symptomatic superficial vein insufficiency with no evidence of a peripheral vascular disease or superficial axial tronchial, a tronchal insufficiency so there is a tributary insufficiency only. So you will start with the first line, which is foam sclerotherapy or phlebectomy. Phlebectomy may be achieved by stab avulsions of portions of varicose veins through small stab incisions 
not requiring suture closure. Foam sclerotherapy injection of foam solution such as sodium tetra desyl sulfate or polydo canal into the small veins followed by compression. If recurrence, so you will repeat phlebectomies or foam sclerotherapy. And we have complications such as DVT, hematoma, some infection, and poor cosmetic outcome. As we said, this is not be sutured. This is tab incisions. And stroke after foam sclerotherapy can be happening. If we have symptomatic superficial vein insufficiency, so the previous was symptomatic superficial vein sufficiency, but this is superficial symptomatic vein sufficiency, no evidence of peripheral vascular disease or superficial tributary insufficiency. There is a truncal axial insufficiency only. We will start with, this is as EMRC has said. So when uh, the QBanks uh, addressed this option, this was for symptomatic superficial vein insufficiency with no evidence of peripheral vascular disease or superficial tributary insufficiency. There is a truncal axial insufficiency only. I will post to the group what is the meaning of a truncal axial insufficiency. So radio frequency ablation or which is called endovenous thermal ablation will be performed on the great saphenous vein or small saphenous vein. Okay. Endo Venous laser therapy generally performed on a uh, great or uh, anterior or short saphenous vein, but may be possible in a branch varicosities as well. The vein will be accessed under, under ultrasound, and in this case, a laser probe is passed up to just below the epigastric vein and uh, remaining below the saphenofemoral junction. This is not needed, but just to know this is the first line for truncal insufficiency only. And then, as the UK guidelines said, if it's, this is unsuitable or unavailable, the ablation we will go for foam sclerotherapy. But surgery is third or uh, last line. Open surgery means stripping and ligation. The main goal of stripping and ligation is to permanently remove the veins with the varicosities. It is to be performed when the greater saphenous vein or a small saphenous vein has reflux that gives rise to these varicose veins. So you will remove the diseased vessels with reflux. If we have both truncal and the tributary insufficiency, then as also the QBank addressed, ablation first, foam sclerotherapy second, and then open surgery. Now it's clear. Because you will find that some questions answered like this, and then after some questions answered like uh, ablation. So now it is clear for you. If we have symptomatic superficial vein insufficiency, no evidence of peripheral vascular disease, perforator veins with reflux located near healed or active venous ulcers. We will go for foam sclerotherapy or endovascular ablation, and we will do compression therapy, bandaging or stockings. 
then we will do perforator surgery as a second line and also we will add this compression therapy. Okay, next question, Kazi Aman, have you answered with us? Aman, then, okay, Aman, you answered already? Yeah. Okay, very nice, uh, Dr. Shahadat and uh, Dr. Arya and Dr. Shadi. I don't know, Dr. Emma, why you are not uh, answering, Dr. Risia, Dr. Nevida. Uh, Dr. Wael Nagar, uh, Mr. Sam, Mr. Yeah, raise your hand again, please. Yani. Okay. Uh, go on. Uh, Dr. Shahadat. Shahadat. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Hello, Dr. Muhammad Taha. You are sharing in the chat, and I'm not able to share in the chat. Dr. Muhammad Taha, can you raise your hand and participate with us, please? Okay. 34-year-old women attend to a regular diabetes clinic with an ulcer on the sole of her foot, the right foot on examination. The foot is worn and peripheral pulse are palpable. The ulcer itself is deep and painless. And you find that uh, she has sensory loss below uh, the ankle bilaterally. A venous ulcer, marjoline ulcer, Cushing ulcer, diabetic ulcer, or arterial uh, diabetic ulcer. There is the neuropathy, and uh, she's already diabetic. So I go with the diabetic ulcer. Painless. And أنا مش عارف أنا مجاوبة إيه أصلا يعني I say diabetic I'm sorry أنا أنا من رأيي كده برضو يعني حد معترض no there is no comment from you I say the diabetic I'm sorry ماشي ما دي diabetic neuropathic ulcer أمال أنا مجاوبة إيه طب تعالى نشوف والله أنا فعلا امبارح فاكر إن أنا ما جاوبتش حاجة diabetic ulcer والله لا ده أنا كده بقى آه لينا آه لا 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 استني بقى ما انا امبارح انا بقول لك يعني فعلا هي فينوس لي طيب لا شود بي دايابيتيك وات بين ذس 34 I'm still with diabetic, I don't know. طيب نقرا الاكسبلينيشن مع بعض انا ما اعرفش بجد. طيب فينوس ulcer occur most often in women after middle age. This occur against the background of DVT, the deep venous insufficiency. There are many stages of skin changes, edema, brown discoloration. The brown discoloration comes with hemocidrin deposits secondary to Uh, extravasation of RBCs, the next stage is eczema like, and then lipodermatosclerosis. Yes, along with the edema of the leg, proximal uh, results in inverted champagne like bottle appearance. Ulceration of the affected skin is often uh, follows trauma and usually affects the medial gaiter area. Okay. Treatment involve uh, compression bandages because there is a venous ulcer type. Well, Bardo, I mean, Muslim. Okay, where is that? Uh, no, I don't know. This is for me, this is a diabetic ulcer. I don't know. Anyone, uh, any art, any. Uh, Arterial doctor here. <laughs> I think it should be diabetic ulcer. I'm not because the because you won't get any uh, sensory loss in venous ulcers. You get it in the arm. 
<laughs> anyone any doctor arti vascular uh, vascular I just uh, the for the time I uh, I comment. will look at uh, that uh, is always painful uh, there is a peripheral pulses yeah. are palpable venous that means painless venous is painless and neuropathic is painless as well and this diabetic patient And even on examination, there is a sensory loss. There is a sensory loss. So this is, should be a diabetic ulcer. She's also very young, only 34. So unlikely to be arterial. Okay, but let's, let's have a look about arterial is painful. So it is not the case. Arterial associated with faint or not palpable pulses. This is palpable pulses. So it's not arterial. Venous on the gaiter area, and it is painless. This is not, and not associated with any sensory loss. So it is not venous. Patient can have type 1 diabetes, can have this sensory loss. This is due to a diabetic neuropathy. So in my opinion, it is a diabetic and Yes. Your opinion is right. Diabetic neuropathy. Yes, he can give you a patient diabetic with a venous ulcer. He can give. But this case is a diabetic ulcer. And I will have a look at the uh, uh, the box because I used big box, not, not just uh, uh, like... Yeah, so it is a diabetic ulcer for me because when Dr. Shahadat answered, I, I got like, no, yes, yesterday I haven't selected any option as a diabetic, but this case, while she's reading, I feel it is all going with diabetic. Again, venous ulcer is painless in the gaiter area, but should not be associated with this sensor loss. Rather, yeah. could and be also the with deep venous insufficiency, varicose veins, leg edema, lipodermatosclerosis, champagne, inverted champagne bottle appearance whatever but this is a diabetic one okay uh, next one investigation for the arterial disease uh, dr risia thank you for opening okay and dr muhammad farid i don't know why you are silent dr tana dr wael nagar we should even you are in the hospital so we <laughs> okay Hello, Dr. Hello, Chester. Hello. Uh, a 75-year-old man with a long history of lumbar spine and hip arthritis presents with sudden severe back pain, blood pressure is 100 by 50, and pulse is 105 per minute. The options are MRI, Discharge with painkillers and arrange OP orthopedic referral, ultrasound scan, abdominal contrast CT, and laparotomy. Hmm. Sudden severe back pain with instability, even mild. For you as a surgical registrar, or surgical SHO, keep in mind. I uh, would go for an MRI. Why MRI? No. I will think triple A. Exactly. Oh. So you have just time to go for abdominal contrast CT scan. Yeah. No time for ultrasound because even in the setting of all hospital, go ask for abdominal CT, okay? So we will request abdominal contrast CT scan or CT aorta if you are of highly uh, like Okay, so abdominal aortic aneurysms are asymptomatic in most patients and often found incidentally. Sudden onset severe back pain, 
should be assessed for triple A and could prove an important early warning uh, sign of impending potential catastrophic complication of triple A rupture. Tachy hypo, tachycardia and hypotension should suggest contained leak. Emergency IV contrast CT is investigation of its choice and don't miss. If you have low into growing pain and you have the same patient and you have just mild low blood pressure, don't hesitate to require CT scan because we know some patients found dead in the ward because of rupture the triple A. It was contained and then lactate of five and then lactate of seven and they found that if okay uh, next question we are going to be deeper inside the vascular surgery okay so Risia thank you Risia uh, okay if you know the question okay read the question if you know it raise your hand because you are afraid to feel depressed, like, oh, I answered the question wrong. You are allowed in your exam to answer about more than 50 or 60 or 70 questions wrong. So don't be uh, feeling shameful or feeling, no, oh, I answered. Okay, answer wrong, go for the next, answer it correct, and be okay. This is how you should solve MRC 300 questions. Okay, so read the question. If you know the answer, raise your hand. Okay, Dr. Muhammad Taha. Go on. An 82-year-old is found to have an complicated 7.5 cent triple A on ultrasound as an incidental finding. He has had a previous emergency Hartman procedure for septic peritonitis secondary to benign diverticular perforation five years earlier. Open triple A repair, EVA, abdominal contrast CT scan, ultrasound, resuscitation, and six monthly ultrasound as a follow up. I will either go with the EVAR or open triple repair. What do you think? Is it open or EVAR? I will go with Ivar. Why? I think the patient is age-wise, uh, history-wise, is unfit. Okay, yes. Uh, yes. I'm going to open this patient with this hostile abdomen or patient opened before and he is elderly, he's 80, around 80. So EVAR is the best. So this case is more than 5.5 centimeters. So this will require, Sorry, mama. Uh, should, should require uh, intervention. Intervention, okay. So surgery is recommended for aortic aneurysm more than 5.5 centimeter and using open or EVAR in the vascular, EVAR associated now, the recent guidelines associated with lower short-term complications, lower morbidity, mortality, and preferable option in elderly, unfit patient with some systemic co significant comorbidities and potentially hostile abdomen means previous multiple surgeries, 
And don't forget that EVAR is requiring good anatomy to put the, uh, the, uh, the endovascular graft in position. This is a to enteric fistula. For MRCS, it is not needed. You will find patient underwent repair and then after complaining of uh, microcytic anemia of unknown origin, and also you can find uh, some sort of uh, upper GI hemorrhage. CT scan of diagnosis, OGD, to discover the source of bleeding. Rupture AAA investigations, we have the first line after ruptured already AAA, you will go for resuscitation, uh, means that uh, endotracheal intubation, assisted ventilation, uh, about three to four liters IV fluids, early substitution of bloods, and then you will do urgent surgical repair. Our to iliac anatomy permitting EVAR, so this will be EVAR. Inpatient with confirmed rupture AAA, three-year mortality was lower among those randomized to EVAR than to an open repair strategy. So EVAR is less mortality. The difference between treatment groups was no longer evident after seven years of follow-up. So on long term, nothing is better. Re-intervention rates was, were not significant different between uh, EVAR versus open. There is some evidence suggesting that EVAR may reduce the mortality more effectively in women than men, but not needed. Okay, you will use broad spectrum antibiotics preoperatively. So EVAR, if patient is unfit, if patient with a good anatomy, if patient is elderly with systemic comorbidities. Again, if there is a symptomatic but not ruptured AAA, as long as symptomatic, repair is indicated regardless of the diameter. Again, as long as a patient symptomatic, repair is indicated without locking into the diameter. So new or new onset or worsening pain, this will indicate aneurysmal expansion and impending ongoing rupture. So best treated urgently as long as symptomatic and uh, you can delay it for some hours, no problem. And again, EVAR is increasingly used in management of patients with symptomatic AAA. Short-term, all case mortality rates did not differ. Okay, no problem, but again, EVAR. Incidental finding, if it is incidentally found, you has found this AAA while you are doing a CT for another reason. This is called incidental finding. So as we told you for uh, AAA detected as incidental finding, you should go with surveillance, means that this is a screening. Okay. Incidental finding more than 5.5 centimeter. So uh, this will be uh, generally repair is indicated in patients with large AAA diameter more than 5.5 centimeter in men or five centimeter in women. And also treatment decisions based on greater, I know this is in the United States, but this is the best practice guidelines in the UK. Okay. Uh, again, 
data suggests in patients with large A, uh, AAA more than 5.5 cm undergo elective repair. EVAR is equivalent to open repair in terms of overall survival, but intervention is higher for EVAR. EVAR reduces AAA mortality, but do not uh, longer term overall survival. Uh, easy, easy, just easy. If you have a AAA more than 5.5 centimeter, not suitable for open, then EVAR is good. There is what's called FIVAR, and this is not our topic. It's called uh, fenestrated EVAR, and it is a viable alternative to open repair for juxtarenal and suprarenal AAA. Why? Because uh, EVAR will not be uh, indicated, will not be going already. Okay, just to preclude all of this, Again, the majority of AAA are below the renal arteries, infrarenal. 95% are infrarenal. The risk is directly proportional to the diameter. Risk of rupture when then less than 4 cm is low. So you will do annual ultrasound. With diameter 4 centimeter to 5.5 six monthly ultrasound if the diameter is greater than 5.5 centimeter so you will do elective what all of these questions what all of these questions it won't to change the approach, ultrasound proven, ultrasound size. Yes, the size is five, seven, yes, you will go as we told you. What if juxtarenal? Juxtarenal not amenable for EVAR, so you can do it open or FIVAR. Or you will do DNA CPR and the patient will die. Okay, just, okay, you will discuss the DNA CPR with the patient. And again, for MRCS, uh, I know it is juxta renal, so EVAR will not be going, but uh, for MRCS, just uh, do that. It that just know that this is a triple A and require repair, nothing more. Keep it simple. Yes. Uh, no, I'm trying to keep it simple, but uh, we must have some knowledge in this course. Just it is an opening for us to search and find an information. You know, it is just it is not just to pass. You will pass with or without course, with course, with with anyone. But we try to enrich our knowledge. This is scientific course rather than I want to pass course. And there will be a failure rate and a pass rate anyway. So why not learn? searching, learn reading a paper, learn sh uh, showing our best practice like this. Okay, uh, Dr. Arfan. Uh, hi. So um, a 75 year old smoker presents with severe rest pain in her right leg. On examination, there is advanced gangrene and cellulitis of the right foot with absent disproportions. And geography shows occluded pleural vessels uh, to the ankle. So what are the options? Lonely amputation, pocket catheter, percutaneous transluminal angioplasts, aortofemoral bypass or above knee amputation. So we know she's got gangrene, so she's got tissue uh, damage. She's got distal absent pulses and she's got uh, severe pain. Uh, is it a rest? Severe pain in her leg. So she's got critical limb ischemia. Um, uh, distal absent pulses. I, I do probably a baloney amputation, but it sounds like a infrapopoteal. Would that be correct? Yes. Take your decision and let me know. And tell me your decision. 
Yeah, so I think it would be a baloney amputation because it sounds like an infrapoptial uh, occlusion um, with gangrene, cellulitis, and absent distal pulses, and there's a severe occlusion at the ankle. Very respectful thinking, yes. So I think it would be a baloney knee amputation. Very nice. So, angioplastic or surgical revascularization is unlikely to succeed where crural vessels are occluded below the ankle. <clears throat> it's especially important to adequately counsel the patient for such a measure. Forefoot amputation will not be advisable in a non revascularized foot. So a below knee amputation may represent the best option to avert the risk of systemic sepsis and restore quality of life. Go back. So this patient, absent distal pulses. But there is another option regarding okay. Why not above knee? Why why not above knee amputation? Uh, better quality of life and uh, you know better uh, physiotherapy outcomes, and it doesn't seem to. Uh, it just seems to extend to the right foot, so you want to preserve as much function as possible. Exactly, and this is the angiography showing crural vessel of the ankle. So why cutting more? while it's better to cut less and it's feasible for you. I know mm. above knee amputation is preferred in some situations, but this is not the case. In some other scenarios, there is single distal runoff. So in this case, if there is a distal single runoff, you can try endovascular revascularization. Okay, but this case you say there is a cellulitis, there is absent distal pulses, and there is occluded crural vessels. He does not talk about anything regarding the distal runoff, regarding any, this is distal disease. So below knee amputation is better. Forefoot amputation can be, but again, this patient with sepsis elderly, so in MRCS, try to be step more than vascular surgeon because another option for this will not clarify cellulites and stuff. You can choose why not uh, metatarsal or uh, or uh, forefoot amputation or whatever. So be just a step above the vascular surgery in unknown scenario for you, and you will go out in your exam break, you will ask vascular surgeon, you will find them argue together. No, this is a better quality of life. This is a smoker. This is hypotensive. Again, vascular scenarios in MRCS part A exam can be amenable to arguing. Okay, so don't expect that you will answer 100% of the vascular and the orthopedics question in your exam but expect that you will find lots of answerable questions you can answer many venous ulcer arterial you will answer many questions duplex uh, no this is ct angio so you will find yourself very well oriented about many scenarios okay next one uh okay so Aman, Shahadat, Kazi, Arfan, thank you, Dr. Arfan, uh, Dr. Muhammad Farid, then Dr. Arij, then Dr. Uh, Lamia, Dr. Muhammad Farid. Dr. Muhammad Farid.
طيب اوكي okay, دكتور عمان يو كان كونتينيو اند ذن 73 يير اولد اوفر يس Hello. Yes. Hello. A 73-year-old overweight smoker presents with pain in his legs after walking half a mile, uh, which is relieved immediately by rest. Ankle brachial okay. pressure index is 0.8. Uh, the options are below knee amputation, conservative management, percutaneous transluminal angioplast, uh, aortofemoral bypass, and above knee amputation. Uh, as he is walking around half a mile. and uh, uh, abpi is 0.8 so i think there is no need of amputation and uh, there is no need of bypass so i think it has to be between conservative management and uh, thinking excellent vascular thinking i think i'll go with b yes conservative yes. excellent so claudication distance of 500 yards may be considered reasonable for this patient Obviating invasive treatment in the first instance is not correct. So ABBI of above 0.9 is normal. But patients with claudication but no wrist pain usually have value between 0.6 to 0.9. And the value below 0.6 is associated with wrist pain and the critical limb ischemia around 0.4. So from 0.6 to 0.9, this is amenable for conservative trial. Stopping smoking, exercise, weight reduction, a medical correction of diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and daily low dose aspirin. Okay, I'm going to talk about some important uh, topics like spinal canal, uh, spinal cord syndromes. Why? Because this is arterial problem. Uh, if we have triple A repair, and after this triple A repair, we found what's called anterior cord syndrome. The main reason is what's called AKA artery, artery of Adam Quex, or uh, the great radicular. radiculomedullary artery or whatever. Why? Because this artery will arise in a specific level from the aorta, from uh, the posterior intercostal arteries, and then will continue to supply the anterior spinal artery. So after triple A repair, this artery of Adam Quix can be in lesion. The resultant will be uh, motor weakness, bilaterally and pain temperature loss bilaterally below this level, below the level of the uh, arterial incident. This is called anterior cord syndrome. If after triple A repair, it can be called Adam Quick's artery lesion or syndrome. So this is anterior, as you see, the white part will be lost. Okay, it's wise to talk about posterior cord syndrome. You will have this dorsal, because the posterior artery will give the dorsal part. So you will have a proprioception and vibration sense loss. But in anterior cord syndrome, because here you see already in the anterior cord syndrome, the vibration and the proprioception are partially spared. Why? Because they supplied already by the posterior uh, spinal artery. So the dorsal cord will be fine. For central cord syndrome, you will have what's called jacket lesion. Central cord syndrome due to syringomyelia or any reason, you will have bilateral motor weakness, upper limb or upper uh, extremities more than lower extremities. Why? Because the upper limb fibers will be found medially. Okay. And this will be affected more, but the lower limb extremity fibers will be found laterally and will be affected less. Hemisection, you will find discrepancy. Why? Because it's called hemisection. Half of the spinal cord will be affected. So if the fibers decussate 
means crossing from side to side. These fibers, you will find that they will produce contralateral affection, like contralateral pain temperature loss, because these fibers of pain temperature in the uh, spinal uh, salamic tract will be decussating, so this will lead to contralateral pain temperature and the ipsilateral vibration proprioception and the ipsilateral uh, motor weakness. This is called the hemisection or brown sequence syndrome. This is our very easy scenarios and can come as orthopedic scenario or vascular scenario. Okay, so any question here about, again, I will explain again. I will explain again if you, okay. So we have, this is the spinal cord. It is divided into like, you know, cores, cores of wires. So this spinal salamic tracts go up and then decussate, and we have dorsal colon will go posteriorly, and we have corticospinal tract going anteriorly. These fibers are responsible for uh, motor function and sensory function, okay? This is the red ones are the motor, and sensory one are this color, like spinosalamic and mix it in this color, not important for, for us, okay? So if you have a, a triple A, this came in January 2019, I think, and Muhammad Mustafa, he failed, he told me, I failed on 1% because I haven't answered this question, and I, addre I addressed this in the 10 days on the group before the exam. So I tagged him like, okay, I mentioned that there is what's called Adam Quick's artery in the question posting session. It was very important. So there is anterior core, anterior spinal artery syndrome after uh, aortic repair because there will be lesion of the artery of Adam Quick's. I posted the post today on the Facebook. If you have a look, it is documented and detailed the anatomy of Adam, Adam Quick's artery, which is not required, it's just a courtesy. So in this scenario, you will have pantalone lesion, the lower limbs affected. So everything below this level will be affected. Motor weakness bilaterally and pain temperature loss bilaterally. This is called anterior, see the white part, this is called anterior spinal artery syndrome. Posterior cord syndrome or posterior spinal artery syndrome, you have the dorsal column will be affected. This posterior column or dorsal column will transfer proprioception and vibration. So if you have affection of the posterior cord artery due to any reason, this can lead to bilateral vibration and the proprioception sensor loss below the lesion. Okay, till now it's clear. Okay, we'll go forward to central cord syndrome and it's written more wrong because the white part should be in the middle. Okay, but central cord syndrome due to syringomyelia means that there is cavitation inside the spinal cord. This will eat from all, will eat from these medial fibers. So there will be a jacket form motor weakness. Why? Because I'm eating from inside here as a syringomyelia or cavitation. So the upper limb fibers are found here. So you'll find the upper extremities are affected more than the lower ones. This is called central core syndrome. Again, hemisection. Hemisection, there is half of the spinal cord affected it due to due to stab or due to a car accident, whatever. So this part, you have what, as we told you, there is a spinal salamic, which are sensory, transferring pain temperature and decussating. Decussating meaning that they are go from a side to a side. 
So when you have a section here, the fibers that supplying the other part will be affected. So this is called contralateral beam temperature loss, but ipsilateral probe reception vibration loss and the ipsilateral motor weakness. This is called hemisection or brown sequoid syndrome. Very nice. Okay, next question. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Farid again. Uh, Dr. Uh, yes, Nvidia. Yes, you opened. Your... Oh, she gone. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. You are here. Okay. Okay. Go yeah. yeah, go on. And if Dr. Mohammed Farid is here, you can. He can go. Okay. Okay. Go on, Nvidia. Okay. A 62-year-old man presents with severe bilateral pain in the legs. He is known to suffer from impotence and buttock, buttock claudication. Femoral pulses are weak. Arteriography shows long occlusions on both common iliac arteries and good distal runoff. Angioplasty, though initially promising, proved unsuccessful. So the options are Bologna amputation, conservative management, percutaneous transluminal angioplasty, iotofemoral bypass, a bony amputation. It is iotofemoral bypass. Why? Because the common iliac arteries are occluded. Very nice. On, on both sides. So you need to create a bypass from the iota to the femoral, possibly on both sides. Uh, but why not angioplasty? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, proven unsuccessful. So yeah, it's, it's proven unsuccessful. Yeah, right. Exactly. But so in this case, the uh, internal iliac arteries will be uh, will not be uh, addressed, right? Sorry. The bypass is to the external iliac artery, right? The internal iliac arteries will not be addressed in this case. Is that so? It is our to by femoral anyway. Yeah, okay. Iliac arteries are occluded. Yes. So you will bypass all the occlusion. It is called aorto femoral. Okay. So the distal aorto bifurcates into two common iliacs, and each common iliac will give external and internal. External artery. That's what I asked. The external iliac continues as femoral. The internal iliacs are always not addressed in this case. And the importance will not be resolved, right? You mean uh, about internal iliac artery because it will give the genital arteries, right? Yeah, right. Yes, yes, of course, because those are artery of the penis. Yes, of course, yes, of course. I mean, yes, yeah. if you mean that, yes. So the okay. external iliac bypass, so because you know the external iliac artery continues as femoral artery, so that is addressed. When the common iliac artery is occluded, the internal iliac artery is not addressed in this case. I don't mean, I don't, I don't know. Uh, what do you mean? Again, sorry. So, uh, sorry to interrupt. Dr. Reda, what I think she's asking is, you know, when there is a blocking of common iliac, so there is no blood going to external and internal. Yes. But with surgery, we are only doing aotofemoral. So what happened to blocked internal iliac? Yeah, that's what. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I have tried to search, but I don't know also. Very nice question. We that's why <laughs> we have <laughs> you, no, I had the doubt when I read the I file, so no, I just yes. wanted to clear it. I had got a chance okay. to read the same that's question. I've asked it for okay. We know we know the MRS is, but I don't know uh, the philosophy or <laughs> I yes, this is a good question to be honest. You yeah. are very nice. Yeah. So you okay. are thinking about where is the where is the internal <laughs> iliac artery will take blood from? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe uh, like that's why we said like if you asked me about the gallbladder and the mechanism of secretion and I can answer and I can give you some philosophy, but I'm not a vascular surgeon. That's why trying to do everything we can do, even if we try to improve the lecture. Okay. But about some sort of question like this, yes, need to be asked on the group after we finish. For a vascular surgery, we need to know uh, uh, 
why the internal from where the internal iliac artery will take blood if we bypass only the segment of stenosis from the aorta to the femoral, but still the internal iliac addressed, still the internal iliac encountered. That's you mean. That's what you mean, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, it's excellent. <laughs> okay, so uh, there is a philosophy and okay. Okay, so this is our two iliac. Okay, this is the explanation of marjoline ulcer and uh, I'm going to talk about thoracic outlet syndrome. Thoracic outlet syndrome and uh, cervical rib is one of the reasons for uh, this thoracic outlet syndrome and 90% of cases will be associated with neurological uh, Sorry, Veda. Yeah, I found out it says uh, uh, there was one article which suggested that if there is a common iliac artery stenosis, uh, aortoiliac bypass with reimplantation of internal iliac artery should be discussed with patient. Okay. Very nice. So they will they will do uh, they will bypass it as well, right? So they're saying first you have to try. Uh, conservative management with uh, lipid lowering drugs and with uh, aspirin or clopidogrel and that okay. is first option and then you give uh, ramipril and then revascularization with uh, angioplasty uh, or primary stent if this doesn't work then you have to offer them uh, aorto femoral bypass but then with aorto femoral bypass you have to give option of uh, giving uh, this uh, reimplantation. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, so thoracic outlet syndrome, neurological and venous and arterial is the least, is the least uh, one. So neurological 90%, venous and arterial. Okay, so if we are going to talk about venous, which is less than the neurological, the venous... Uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, the first line is catheter directed thrombolysis. Because many people will ask uh, why it is catheter directed thrombolysis. Because many reasons no, of no, no. What? will be a uh, catheter directed thrombolysis. And even uh, baget schrauter syndrome, which is uh, the axillary subclavian vein thrombosis, is also thrombolysis using catheter directed method followed by ferrous strip resection. So the first line of venous thoracic outlet syndrome associated with thrombolysis, it will be a catheter directed thrombolysis. This is if surgical candidate and if non-surgical candidate, you have tried uh, the same without including surgery, which is uh, first rib resection mainly. Okay, next question. We need survivors, okay? So many people are like, okay, our first lecture was 35 uh, people attending, trying, and then will decrease, and then we will decrease to 10. Little will pass. That's why every course has got about 30 percentage failure because people are oh like oh i shouldn't participate i shouldn't you have to you have to not even with me after i finish you have to okay so i'm sorry for some indian and asian countries and the arabian countries as well that they are now it is late for them but we we must try one day to have breaking our routine okay so kazi and then dr shahadat and then the poor Erfan again. So a 70 years old man complains of severe acute abdominal pain all over the abdomen, followed by vomiting and blood stain diarrhea. Six weeks prior to this episode, he had a myocardial infarction. Examination reveals a patient who had blood pressure of 100, systolic pulse rate of 120 beats per minute, atrial fibrillation with cold extremities and tachycardia. Abdominal, ex abdominal examination reveals generalized tenderness, rigidity, and rebound tenderness. 
the options are ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, diverticular bleed, acute small bowel ischemia, and acute appendicitis. So I would go with acute small bowel ischemia. This is because this patient had a myocardial infarction in the past. So there's a risk that a clot has been uh, dislodged from there. Secondly, the acute presentation with generalized abdominal tenderness and rigidity shows there's a sign of uh, ischemia at the moment. So it is acute small bowel ischemia, I suppose. Yes, it is acute small bowel ischemia because this is vascular session. So <laughs> you expect it. <laughs> okay. And so this is a vascular question. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> this is the explanation. So uh, yes, you you corrected the um, just kidding with you. So it is just a bloody diarrhea and uh, acute abdomen, peritonitic acute abdomen. There is tenderness, rigidity, and rebound. And so blood diarrhea and uh, acute abdomen on top of patient with uh, 70 year old of age and MI. Okay. So this is my BAF leads to uh, systemic embolization or, or embolism, this embolism uh, or detached embolus from this mural thrombus of the heart going mm -hmm. to the uh, superior mesenteric artery mainly yeah. leads to acute small bowel mesenteric ischemia. What is the investigation of a choice? It's CT angio. Okay, mesenteric angio. So we answered all wow. of them. So So the, the, the types of small bowel ischemia, we have arterial thrombosis. This is, will be a chronic or acute on top of chronic because of atherosclerosis and the thrombotic condition super added. Arterial embolism, you have source of embolus, either AF, mural, or uh, in uh, like atherometer plaque and the mural thrombus in a triple A. So this can lead to embolism. Venous thrombosis, we have malignancy, sepsis, inflammation, I mean. You have hypercoagulable states, uh, like in malignancy, of course. Rare causes, we have uh, aortic dissection. We have cardiac bypass. We have intervention radiology. No, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, uh, Dr. Arfan, I don't know. It's not important. Just diagnose and know the investigation. Okay, uh, either thrombolysis in mesenteric ischemia, uh, uh, parenteral anticoagulation. Uh, so uh, gang gangrenous segment will go for surgery, but don't go deeper. Okay, because there are many options there. So Okay, uh, next question, Dr. Uh, Lamia again, and then Dr. Uh, Aman, if he not answered, and Dr. Reese, yeah, if you want. Dr. Reese, um, Aman? Yes. Yes, go on. A 65 years old man complains of left calf claudication at 50 meters. Angiography reveals a 10 centimeter stenosis of the superficial femoral artery. Uh, below knee amputation, uh, conservative management, percutaneous trans uh, luminal angioplasty, orthofemoral uh, bypass, and above knee uh, amputation. So, uh, no indication for amputations. Um, for the, it is a claudication of at 50 meters and the, the, uh, the stenosis is uh, long. Uh, so, uh, we can go first. Uh, 
so there is also no indication for conservative management because it's, it's still, on, still not long. Huh? It's still not long. More than ten is long. This is borderline. More than yes, but so you you can you can try the least huh. a step a step down. Yeah. In your exam, okay. to be honest, we'll let you know that this is a short segment stenosis. But this question came before it came before it, it came for the exam. So I don't try to make it simple because I must give you a guidelines, which is best practice and current one on the beginning of the slides saying that this is a still 10 centimeter amenable for ATA, amenable for angioplasty. Okay. So the mm -hmm. superficial femoral artery becomes a popliteal artery in the popliteal fossa. This is of course. So it is for this scenario with pigment stenosis is still amenable for angioplasty. Next one. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Farid, Dr. Farman, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Taha, Dr. Risi, yeah, yes. Okay, and Dr. Risi and then Dr. Mohammed Taha. Okay, Dr. Risia or Dr. Muhammad Taha, Dr. Hello. Hello, yes. Yes. Uh, a 70 years old male present with a one week history of uh, mid back pain and right leg uh, claudication at 250 years. Imaging show enlarged dual lumen, descending thoracic and abdominal aorta. He is known to be hypertensive. Option is a bypass surgery, open repair, endovascular repair, aortic root replacement, and sodium nitroprolol. Uh, one week back pain. Good. I think uh, age-wise is not fit for surgery. I exclude the uh, open repair. Do you and, know the uh, case? What? Do you know what is the case? Yeah. Um... Dual human. Yeah, yeah. يعني إيه طيب؟ يعني منسلخ يعني يا 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 ترابل اير از جونج از دايسكشن سو Okay, so just again, because it was at the beginning of the notes. So remember this guy, this is Abraham Lincoln. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know him personally because he's dead. <laughs> okay. And uh, he told as striking and he is not aortic dissection. He, uh, this is a wrong uh, historical information that he died from this aortic dissection. So remember the Marfan syndrome, which is connective tissue disease, mm -hmm. one associated with aortic dissection. So if said strikingly tall, even not painful, chest, uh, not essentially to give you chest pain in a patient with uh, mild uh, instability, you have to think about uh, association between Marfan syndrome, strikingly, strikingly tall person like this, and uh, aortic dissection. And cystic medial necrosis uh, with fusiform aneurysm. Okay, but this is not the case. Our case is aortic dissection, which is type A versus type B. We have we have Stanford A and Stanford B. Stanford A. This means that this is the dissection involving all of these segment, or this is called Debakey type one or just the ascending one. This is Debakey type two. 
This is called the Stanford A in both cases. And the treatment, as you see here in this video, is aortic replacement. Okay. So this is uh, Stanford A. And this is not the case. The case is thoracic and the abdominal involved. So this is called a type B, Stanford B, antihypertensive is a treatment, and it is called BKT. So this is our case. Stanford B, aortic dissection involving the sending reaching to the beginning of the aortic one. So it is aortic dissection, and the treatment is the beta lol or uh, whatever the beta blocker, propranolol, some nitroproside, it's just a treatment for this uh, Stanford B, TBK3, aortic dissection, antihypertensives. Okay, it can present with a tearing acute retrosternal chest pain or interscapular back pain or silent. Okay. CT angio is the best investigation, and transesophageal echo is a reliable second alternative. I'm very thankful for you all, the survivors, and really uh, very happy for your level. And again, try to solve. As you see here, it is just a question, a mix of question and explanation. Thank you very much. Rada, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rada. Thank you, Dr. Rada. Thank you, Dr. Rida. Assalamu alaikum Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so Will much. this be posted in the group? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.